This conference will now be recorded. And Lynn and Rebecca, good to see you. Hi, Ren. How are you? I'm good, surprisingly. Good. Um, so when we look at the meeting summary, we're, we're just going to hit that first. Um, I, I didn't see much that was in any way inaccurate. Uh, I, I did want to say that the um, the toughest issue I think that we have not yet tackled that we're going to have to address sooner or later is the you know the whole issues on Northwest Rail, and that's mentioned in here. But I read the summary you know that we we have in here for this meeting, and oof, it's grim. You know, 2042 is hard to imagine. I wish I were enough of a futurist to have some idea of what that's going to be like. But I'm I'm a nearsighted futurist myself. So that's that's tough. Anybody have any other comments on the meeting summary? Anybody see anything missing? And may I say that I so much appreciate you guys from Dr. Cog putting those together. All right, let's move on then. Um, Lynn, uh, would you like to start off and tell us something about the meeting last night? And, and and also, I wanted to ask you if you guys had any chance, since you were dealing with the 2021 budget, to discuss the uh, legislative initiative conversations we've been having. Sure, um, we did. I brought that up in in other matters, and um, I'm gonna I'll start with. Real quickly, with you may have seen in the paper this morning on CPR um, that the governor sent a letter to Deborah Johnson, our new CEO, and uh, yep. Chair Rivera Malpietti yesterday. Uh, Deborah had a short conversation with him um, as well, and uh, you know he was raising uh, a number of questions about um, you know other things that RTD is doing to contain costs in addition to layoffs, um, uh, many of which uh, Bruce Abel went through uh, all of that with this committee and uh, we actually had talked with the governor's staff uh, several weeks ago and went through it then too. But um, you know, it, it was raising questions about um, layoffs, uh, actually salary cuts, furloughs, uh, layoffs of um, non-represented, non-union staff and um, uh, how we are prioritizing transit uh, for essential workers and, and some of those things. And um, uh, the uh, staff is working on a letter that is responsive to the governor and we'll be getting that to the accountability committee as well. He asked that we do a full um, report to the accountability committee on CARES Act funding and, and all of that. Our CARES Act funding is um, controlled by FTA and uh, its reimbursement basis. Uh, some of you um, probably know yep. that that uh, we spend the money um, in your uh, in the documents that RTD has provided to the accountability committee. There's a series of spreadsheets that goes into very specific detail about um, how the money's used because we spend the money, RTD spends the money, and then um, seeks reimbursement from FTA, and so it's very specific. But uh, you know, I think uh, RTD is staff are, are, is very happy to meet, and I think we should at this point, um, you know, at the governor's request, go through some of that um, uh -huh. and update you on. You know, we're going. It will be a lower number of layoffs. I, We've been able to, with additional sales and use tax, bring the number down to 399, about three quarters of which are um, represented. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I guess what a, I think it would be a good thing to put on the committee's agenda in the near future to um, update on some of these issues. Um, um, Ron, can you make sure that's on our agenda for the next meeting? Yeah, and it, it would be good if we could speak positively to that issue as well uh, with the governor and his staff because you know I I also as I recall in the FTC grants for this in the CARES stuff in the CARES Act itself they're rather specific about what you can use it for right. and it's it's not like 
you know, you could, there are a lot of things you might like to do that you can't do with that money. And it is all reimbursement. So. Yeah, no, I, and uh, I think RTD has been very careful to, you know, make sure that they um, fall within those guidelines. And like I say, you know, it's up to uh, FTA to approve the reimbursement. And okay. all of that. Go, ahead, go ahead. I didn't mean to break no, this that, That's mostly the update. We'll be getting you a copy in the next few days of the letter and uh, and RTD's response. Um, he, the governor requested specifically that we not that RTD not do any layoffs until um, uh, there's a stimulus bill or whether it's clear whether there's a stimulus bill or something like that. Um, so you know that at this point none of the um, notices of layoffs are going out until January. When Deborah Johnson started last week, she began her first day with an all employee meeting and she was hearing feedback that people, um, that made her decide that, that uh, no notices would go out until January and um, that, uh, uh, you know, just to, to increase the communication. So I guess that's my report is that there will be a, uh, the letter and uh, response coming very soon and uh, and happy to provide uh, the right person or people to give the update to the committee. I have a meeting tomorrow at the governor's office on uh, uh, things related to COVID and how, you know, how we could uh, find assets within RTD there. I'm, one of the things I'm wondering is if we can find money within that stimulus bill that might allow us to, to keep some of those people. You know, this is really a long shot, Lynn, but if we could, if we could find some funding from there, part of what, uh, what they want to do uh, over at CDPHE is be able to send support teams out to some of the uh, local health uh, services providers that are not necessarily well staffed and and particularly when you're doing mass inoculations or mass vaccinations and so i've got something in my slide deck that relates to that and so i might be able to bring some of that up i know it's still it's probably a long shot but it's worth taking and uh and along, along those same lines if you could just pop me over a copy of the letter sure. so i know you know where the frame of mind is for the, for the governor and the staff Sure, yeah, no problem. That'd be great, right? Yep. Hey and guys, it's it's Jackie. I just I'm, I'm not going to interrupt a lot. I promise. But if you are going to talk to the governor right tomorrow, particularly about these issues, I do want to uh, mention one of the things that I have read, but don't know for sure, is the governor is considering allowing businesses to retain their sales tax um, as a as a potential COVID relief pack as part of a COVID relief package that would be devastating to not just rtd but all of the local governments um, that rely on the sales tax for funding the operations in the city and i just want to make sure the governor is very aware of the impacts of allowing something like that to happen and really the the unintended consequences to local governments including rtd about that so if you could just carry that message i'd be very appreciative all right, I'll see. I'll see if I can work that into my into what I'm talking about. One of the one of the parts of that though isn't a part of the sales tax uh, go that goes straight to state, and another part that's apportioned off for cities. Yes, that is correct. However, that money is held in trust by the business. It is not paid to the business, and it is not a cost to the business. And it really would be unprecedented for uh, the state to allow businesses and allow the public to even think that that is money paid by the business. It is actually money paid by the consumer that is held in trust by the business that is then sent on. And I, I just think um, I appreciate the creativity and in, in the uh, really there's no bad ideas, but I really think the unintended consequences of that would be devastating. So. Well, one one other observation about that: if you if you do something like that, um, there are certain parties in this state that are always looking for a way to cut taxes, 
And so if you do that once, might it not require a Tabor vote of the people in order to restore the collection of those taxes? No, because it is a, um, we only have to have a Tabor vote if we're increasing, <laughs> not decreasing. But once so you, if we're, once you if, lowered what you're taking, then no, I, they would, I think there are people who are crazy enough to say, oh, yeah. well, it's a tax increase yeah. if you try to get it back. Well, I don't think they would lower it. I think they would still be collecting it. They would just be keeping it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It wouldn't, they wouldn't decrease the revenue collected. They wouldn't say we're going to lower the, the sales. Like for example, the sales tax in Lone Tree is 6.1825. The state takes two of it. They're not going to suggest we go down to 4.125. They're still going to collect the 6.125, but they're going to allow the small business or any business potentially to retain that money versus pay it forward to the state. So it wouldn't be a reduction, you know what I mean? The consumer is still paying it. Yeah, I, if I were in your situation, that's exactly the way I'd interpret it. Um, my only concern is there are other people around the state who are always looking for an opportunity to, to bring out a Tabor lawsuit. Yeah, and I live by most of them, so I hear you. <laughs> I'll own that. Yeah, they're the ones that vote for you. <laughs> no, no, I don't know about that. I'm not claiming yeah. that, but... <laughs> Okay, we need to, we, we should go on. We, I don't want to get stuck on that. Uh, Lynn, was there anything, uh, what was the general feelings about the legislation? I think um, there were a few additional comments. Uh, I think that there's still concern about, uh, you know, raising, as as I talked with you about, Rhett and, and Elise uh, in that email, raising the issues um, that, uh, it may be an, an invitation or an opportunity for other people to start adding a lot of amendments that are yeah. not intended by the committee and and, uh, and by RTD and um, so just opening that possibility and and as we talked about I think you know if if you move forward if the committee moves forward at this point I think it would be really important to pull very tight separate bill titles. Um, and so some of that was reflected. Uh, one person asked, um, you know, they were talking about SB 151, that the, the focus on that was people with disabilities. And they said, well, why are we just looking at these things now, these particular uh, statutory provisions and, uh, you know, have that other drop away. And, and uh, you know, we, Troy and I assured him that, that uh, EPA issues and, and issues that have been raised um, are being looked at. I, I think that's in the operations committee. I'm not sure subcommittee, but uh, but yeah. those are being looked at. There are a lot of other things that are being looked at. This was sort of um, the low hanging fruit, I think, if that's a fair way to say the way the committee looks at it, um, to get the restrictions that are in there. Um, yeah, we're just looking for flexibility and a greater flexibility for RTD. But I appreciate the risk uh, concerns. Uh, let me let me talk to some people over on the legislative side and see uh, how we can manage that. I know one of the ways is you write the language very tight, and if it falls outside the bill titles, then it doesn't, it can't be done under this. So a big part of this is single subject, and that's, right. a, that's a strict rule for the legislature. So I'll look at the single subject issue too. Great. Thanks. That sounds good. Um, the issue of the 58% uh, maximum came up and, and uh, someone was suggesting, was asking if this has been um, discussed with the union uh, run by our by RTD Civil Rights Division. I certainly can run it by the Civil Rights Division. Uh, you know, I just said that it's not our, our issue, so we haven't taken it to the union, but um, Right. Uh, that and it's good. not in our list of things that we're planning on uh, trying to get. Okay. So, um, you know, that I, that was talked about, but we looked at that and we, we said that's going to be a real political football. We want to keep it as simple as possible. Okay. Um, it can of works. <laughs> I think, uh, just looking at my notes, uh, in addition to some of what we discussed before, I think that's most of uh, most of the comments, you know, I think the general view is, as we've said before, is that, um, you know, flexibility um, 
we appreciate the committee's in, you know help in getting the flexibility um at the same time that's balanced against the concern of other things coming in and just the reminder that these are not going to be big cha big game changers for rtd um, so we'll, we'll work on those game changers though yeah okay <laughs> thanks that's i think pretty much where we were okay thank you lynn sure okay we're well behind schedule so let's roll right ahead um the revenue forecast. Uh, can we hit that pretty fast? I've got a I've got a couple of questions on it when we get to it, but uh, that's part of our packet here. And um, and I this this I understand comes off information from September 2020. And my concern on the revenue forecast is, you know, this COVID, this big COVID cycle that we're in, that's that's hitting us so hard right now wasn't hitting us so hard in September when some of these estimates were made of revenues. And I have a fear if this goes on into 2021, then it may make our budget challenges even greater. So I just wanted to, to make that comment uh, for the record that uh, I always worry about revenue forecasts because you know, if you take if you take a thousand, <laughs> well, you, people that are involved in predicting future finances, uh, you get a lot of different opinions, and uh, it's a hard thing to do. I'm not saying that they're not doing their jobs well. I'm just saying it's a hard thing to do, and I've seen it burn people in organizations before including some companies that I tried to run, <laughs> startups. So, um, the uh, yeah, so my main concern with the revenue forecast is, is the COVID surge and how that may impact things. So, anybody else want to comment on the uh, revenue projections? The Right. My only comment, I, and I can't remember which meeting I heard this in. I've got to close my door. My door is coming. i got to close it. Okay. If we have a delivery, then you won't be able to hear a thing. <laughs> she loves to go after those people, especially when there's glass between her and them. So... I'm sorry, Rebecca, go ahead. No, that's okay. I So I can't remember which meeting I heard this in, but I, I thought there was some discussion of getting a, a second forecast from a different group. Yeah. You know, I was wondering, I, I think it was a comment of, that I had. I was wondering what, what the state government uses for revenue forecast. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't continue to work with, with CU in that group, but if there are other revenue forecasts out there that are already being created and that other agencies of government are looking at, I would think no reason why RTD couldn't have a look at those as well to, to try to especially figure out that minimum, median, and maximum, what the range of those might be. Lynn, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, a couple of thoughts. I, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that the uh, office planning and and uh, some of the other the states, but using lead school as well. Um, I see Doug McLeod on here. I don't want to put you on the spot, Doug, but I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, at this Hi, Lynn. Yes, thank you. Um, and you're absolutely right. So um, they do work together. The OSPB, um, there's one other state agency too that does forecasting that they leads and OSPB do look at their forecasts and compare. Um, leads typically comes in a little bit uh, more conservative overall. The one thing um, that we can't use those others forecasts for are RTD in particular because our region is, our area, our district is so specific geographically. So they're not apples to apples exactly, but um, they do give us a, a barometer to compare to. Okay, that would be useful it. to get in, in our notes for the meeting. That is the first good explanation of, of that that I've heard. So thank you, Doug. 
Yeah, sure. The geographic specificity of the region is something I had not considered. And I do realize that that's not relevant for most of the statewide organizations. Yeah, and we do, we look at city and county of Denver because they usually track fairly closely to us, but then we'll have years because they tax things differently. Um, so, you know, we can kind of look ballpark at some of these other areas, but um, you know, like city and county of Denver is down 11% year to date on their sales and use taxes, but we're only down 5%. So <laughs> it just depends. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, okay. Rebecca, does that inform that issue for you yes right I, I did want to just chime in i think um one i, th I think what rebecca is referring to is we ha we have been told that rtd is in the process now of issuing an rfp if they if they haven't issued an rfp yet they're getting ready to issue an rfp to to solicit for who they use to do their revenue forecasts so i think you know they may continue with leads or it may it may change i think i think that's that's maybe what you're remembering rebecca okay thank you i just i remembered something <laughs> thanks right and the thanks. fact that leads is somewhat conservative doesn't give me any heartburn And thanks, Ron. This is Doug McLeod again. Yes, that's true. We just issued the RFP for our sales and use tax forecasting because the contract with Leeds is in its final year. That ends at the end of this year. Um, so we expect, uh, we've asked to have proposals back by December 1st, and then uh, we should be able to select from somebody then. I would say that in the past, we've gotten very few responses to our RFP. Mm -hmm. I would guess there are not a lot of organizations that are, really have good capabilities in that area anyway. Yeah, that, exactly. And with that, they don't really have the expertise and the modeling capability. I think we got a couple of individuals um, that uh, didn't seem to have the qualifications in prior RFPs. But uh, yeah, there's very few that have the qualifications that actually bid on this contract. Okay. All right. Anything else? Uh... Ron, we need to know from the revenue forecast. No, Mr. Chair, I think the, the point was to get this information out to the subcommittee, a very, very brief initial sort of introduction of this. Feel free to review the full the full report, but try to use this to help inform sort of your thought process as you dig into other RTD financial issues. Right. Okay, um, peer agencies. Um, Rebecca, do you want to kick this off or do you want to immediately pass it over to Natalie? I don't know if anything in addition to our initial discussions uh, have been done, but uh, it is it, it is worthwhile just to let the committee, the, not just the committee, but the other people that are on this call let know a little of what we what we've been doing there. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think we would ask Natalie to go ahead and chime in, but we, you know, at your request we did have a um a side meeting to discuss how to to further narrow the look at, at peer agencies and gave some guidance to natalie on that so perhaps she could just provide an update on on what she's looking at compared to what she presented at the at our meeting last time okay natalie you're on yeah. hi yeah um so since our last meeting um i talked with dan and rebecca and i think we decided to narrow down that list of peer agencies, um, primarily based on um, density um, because of the efficiency benchmarks and how that relates to um, an area's density. So um, what we have now for peer agencies is King County Department of Metro Transit in Seattle, Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, um, Dallas Area Rapid Transit, and Metro Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority. So, um, what was that? MARTA, yeah. MARTA, that's, yes. That's mm -hmm. a, I thought that was a particularly good good one. Oh, by the way, I, I know you're presenting on uh, passes and, and how people charge for transit. And I think some of those agencies are some of the ones that you, you were talking at there. I know, I know DART was one of them. Uh, that that would be an 
I, I looked through that PowerPoint and it really looked pretty interesting. It might be something we want to have you uh, present to us as well. Sure, yeah, it's um, basically just a quick overview of some of the past options that um, these peer agencies provide. Um, it also includes Houston Metro as yeah. well, which isn't identified as a peer agency, but right. also interesting. Okay, go ahead. Do you want the past presentation? No, not not this minute. <laughs> we have time to do it, but I, I would like uh, for the next time we meet, I'd like for you to have a chance to run through that relatively quickly, like 10 minutes. I know there's going to be a much longer discussion in uh, today's, is it operations meeting? Yeah, yeah. I may sit in on that. Yeah, and I, I think that'll be a, a quick overview of some of these passes. Um, that they offer and then more resources that people can look into if they're curious about um, fair structures and things like that. Yeah, I'll be curious what accountability or operations comes up with in this because it is it is true that we have a fairly complex structure of, of what things cost and, and all the different sorts of tickets and discounts and everything else. And RTD's looked at this, I know, but I, I, uh, I wonder if it might be a suitable subject, certainly for operations. I mostly want to be informed. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go. Was there anything else you wanted to add, Natalie? Uh, nope, I think that was it. Okay, good. So um, the proposed legislative changes, I know we we had talked about that before. Uh, in in uh, the conversations, in emails, and things like that, that uh, that Elise and I have had uh, with with Lynn, we're we're sort of converging, I think, to to something that might actually be acceptable for everyone. Uh, I know there are still concerns about about unfriendly amendments, and we'll have to see how tightly language could be could be uh, drafted and titles. But um, the the one thing is one of the things that we had in that uh, in the last draft of it was the idea of uh, providing some kind of numerical estimates on carbon use per passenger on you know per ridership for individuals and and I think that uh, gave a little heartburn to some of the folks that w had looked at the first draft and you know we're not married to that Lynn we we'd be willing to drop that piece I think it's going to come up as time goes by just because there's such an increasing sensitivity to carbon budgets but uh, as you pointed out in your email it is a really tiny fraction of the overall carbon production uh, that we have right now and so uh, I think I think the more important thing there is to have ridership as a as a bigger uh, and more critical measure because we're in a deep hole there right now in RTD and uh, it it's some something that we have to figure out how we're going to drive this higher ridership. But I talked to Lynn about it and, and she's okay letting that go. I think it might come up from Rack or some of those folks later on, but we'll see. So since we already talked about this some, you know, from our perspective, we'll probably go ahead and see how tightly language could be drafted for something like this and, and who I think the most likely uh, um, people to carry it are Faith and uh, Matt, but that we'll we'll see. We get a we'll get a pulse on that too. Okay. Um, back to our agenda. We turn these things over. Does anybody else want to uh, have anything to say about the legislative uh, proposals as they currently they currently sit, including some of the uh, RTD folks? who are on the call, if they would like to have something to say on that. 
or Julie, if you'd like to. I don't have anything to say. I, I agree and understand Lynn's um, concerns that were raised. I think they were very important and valid. Um, one of the things that uh, I guess I'm thinking about, you know, in a you know operationalized <laughs> way is, you know, typically there's a lobbyist behind a lot of these bills. Do we have a lobbyist? Are we going to use a lobbyist? You know. How is any of that going to work? Well, there's always lobbyists all around it on all sides. I, but I'm not sure that, frankly, these particular actions are going to be that controversial. At least a couple of legislators I've talked to didn't really feel like this was likely to be uh, very controversial. They did feel like the 58% deal would probably be controversial and would bring a lot of uh, pushback from labor. But We've yeah. That out for now. Yeah. Well, and the only reason why I ask and bring up that question is, you know, to address Lynn's concerns of who's managing amendments and things like that, and how does this, and and maybe this isn't a, a conversation for this group, but that's just something I'm thinking about. If we really want to push these forward, mm -hmm. how do you actually do that? Right. Well, I would. Go ahead. I hope Jennifer is going to, if we can work with RTD, Jennifer would probably be playing some of that role. She probably would anyway, but Lynn, you look like you're uh, starting. No, I think that's a, that's a really good question. And, and uh, you know, I guess it gets back to Jennifer works for RTD and, and uh, Brandon Berry is who Brett's referring to. Um, so, you know, if you're wanting to keep this uh, separate, um, you know, it's a it's a discussion to be had, I guess. But I, I appreciate you raising that, Julie, because I do think um, that makes a difference. Um, Bill Soroy has also texted me um, that there may be some issues with the parking. Uh, and Bill, is that uh, I think Bill's there somewhere? Is that something you want to raise? Yeah, Bill, he's on he's on the call, so. Oh, thanks. Just trying to unmute myself. Um, I, I just wanted to ask the question about the the new the the latest change with regarding to exempting RTD from local parking requirements in zoning in zoning ordinances. I didn't know what the intent for that was, um, and I just wanted to raise concerns because anytime you talk about parking and zoning, it's usually controversial. And right. uh, just wanted to what 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 the intent was. The, I can. I think I can speak to that. Uh, other committee members may want to as well. But if you're going to build, a, if you want to build transit oriented housing mm -hmm. with the goal that the people that are staying there are not paying the cost of, of constructing, a, you know, $375 a month net cost parking space and a half based on local zoning ordinances, the, then you want to you want to have some way of controlling whether or not they're going to own cars too, because I've seen uh, I've seen uh, affordable housing built in some cases in neighborhoods, and then these people wind up parking on the street that that are in the affordable housing and and taking up a lot of the what is generally considered to be by the people that live there in single family homes their parking spaces. And so, as you probably know, Bill, there's a potential conflict there. So it's a little different when you're building them in, a, in an area where you've got a great big parking lot that's owned by RTD. And, uh, and right now, the, there's a real sensitivity to any of that parking being used by people other than people that are riding transit. But the idea of a transit-focused property is that they should not be having cars or Another way that you might do that is you might say, okay, we're going to build a limited amount of parking, but it's going to be all electric vehicles, for example, on the environmental side with chargers attached, you know, to the parking that are essentially free chargers, but people could rent those cars or lease those cars or get use of those cars for the times that they did need that. But it would be limited as to the number of those vehicles and, and uh, uh, where they were. So I've, you know, I've been brainstorming a little bit about this, but I think it, that nothing goes forward 
in terms of actually proposing something like that without sitting down with some with some people that are involved in development of of affordable housing. Yeah, and, that's and I think one that... of the situations in which you might want to restrict parking. We want these people to be people who are committing themselves to to use mass transit and to use our, yeah. our trains and our buses. And I think this is this is exactly what we're intending to do with which I think something Lynn brought up earlier that with our um, equitable TOD policy that we'll be bringing to our board next month, um, addressing the issue of parking and particularly replacement parking in RTD facilities. But I think that just the one word of caution I know just a, a lot of experience with parking and discussions with local jurisdictions about parking. It's a very sensitive issue and sometimes can be very controversial. Even with affordable housing developments, I don't know if you've read, you know, about uh, uh, developments in Denver where they proposed to eliminate parking requirements for affordable housing, and have had neighborhood revolts. So I, I just want to raise that because I do think the idea of exempting RTD from zoning requirements of parking could raise issues, not necessarily even just with local jurisdictions, but with community members. And I, I just don't want us to, I just don't want us to lose sight of that fact. That's a, a great point. Yeah. Okay. There, interestingly enough, in, in Tempe, Arizona, they, they are building a rather large housing development with no parking at all. But it is in a situation where it is kind of self-contained, which you don't get if you drop one of these things in a neighborhood. I think part of what you could do or couldn't do would depend on uh, where a particular rail station, for example, is located. There are some of them that uh, are located uh, closer to the middle of a lot of other housing and things like that. So, yeah, but you're right to raise the issue, and I appreciate that. And duly noted for our meeting summary, I think we really need to uh, uh, have that as a uh, something that we're thinking about as we and if we move forward with the idea of affordable housing or how to, housing for the for specifically targeted at the disabled community is another uh, kind of development that might be of interest there but take a lot of thinking yeah so let's uh let's keep moving along um the, the really the last thing and the and the really big thing is how are we doing on our focus areas? We were given pretty clear direction from uh, the governor and the legislature as to the sorts of things that this the accountability committee broadly speaking are supposed to be working on. And as we look down that list, there are another th a lot of other things that we brought into that list that are in some cases more specific. And so if you look at that part of the handout towards the end of the agenda items, Ron, maybe you could pop that up for us. And, uh, you know, we're only a few months into this, so we're not necessarily gonna have dealt with every one of these issues, to say the least. But um, I think we are gonna need to start saying, Here's one we feel like we've moved, we've got pretty well control and we can move on from. Okay, let me get this up a little larger on my monitor. Good. So the first one is this CARES Act issue. And I think we've already gotten the information we need for the most part from RTD. Uh, to go back to uh, the governor and the legislature and say, yeah, they didn't go out and throw parties with the CARES Act money, and here's where we actually spent that, and here's here's uh, why we spent it that way. And along with this is the fact that there are some restrictions uh, built into the CARES Act as to what it's spent on. Lynn, do you know how, how much is left? Is there some part of that left that I thought the goal was to run to use it all within by the end of the year. Can you comment on that? Can't hear you with your mic muted. 
Sorry, uh, Doug, Doug McLeod may be a better person to give you uh, specific numbers. I, I think that uh, I think we will be using it by the end of the year, but it is letting us carry some uh, other funding over to the start of next year. It, it, Doug, can you help with that? Sure. Sorry, I missed it. You're talking about the status of the CARES grant? Yes. And whether it will carry over to next year? Sure. Sure. So, um, so the CARES grant, as you know, is 200, $232 million. Um, through the end of September, we had collected 80 or drawn 89% of that. Um, and as was indicated earlier, what we have to do is first spend the money, but then we draw down the funds after that. So it's really just all of our draws have been based on salaries, benefits, and then purchase transportation where we uh, pay contractors for both our fixed route and our um, commuter rail, fixed route bus and commuter rail. So we've drawn down 89% of that. Um, it, there's only 24 million left to draw after the September month end close. So we will have that all drawn down by the end of the year. Okay. Red, I do have a little bit of a different perspective on this one. I, you know, I appreciate that we have the spreadsheet now, but I don't, I don't know that just having that in hand constitutes a thorough review. Um, and if if the governor is asked in in RTD plans to give a, a fuller presentation, I wonder. Do we know if that's with the full committee or with our subcommittee? Because I'd, I'd certainly appreciate that. I, you know, just having the numbers is one thing, but sort of having more behind it would sure help. Right. And since these are all recorded, I mean, the other thing we can do then is segment that piece off and say, here is a good explanation of where all the CARES Act funds went. Um, is that something? Doug, you might be able to, you and, and Lynn and whoever else from RTD is appropriate, to come in and beyond just the spreadsheet, give us some detail. Absolutely, yeah. In fact, so the governor's letters, you know, uh, we got that yesterday and then the, I believe, I saw it yesterday for the first time. And so um, our communications department, Pauletta Tanilis, along with uh, Deborah Johnson, are kind of working on a response right now. But yeah, I'd be happy to talk through uh, the details and, and what all that represents. Because I know it's kind of messy if you look at it. There's a lot of numbers there. Um, but yeah, anytime you want, I'd be happy to do that. Great. I don't know. Go ahead, John. I was just going to suggest, um, you know, you may want to do, if there's the deeper review you want to do in the subcommittee, that may make sense. But given the fact that the governor has asked for for some of this and, and an update on, uh, you know uh, the the prioritization of services for uh, essential workers and and um, you know some of the other things that we've gone through with the committee before, but kind of could update in terms of uh, other cuts uh, that are being made to balance the budget. I, I think it probably makes sense to do some sort of um, presentation in the full accountability committee meeting in November. And the other thing is. That it okay. probably makes sense to wait until all of the work that you need to do to, to respond to the governor has been done before we get our presentation. Sure. Is that true, Rebecca? I think there's a response that will be prepared in just in the next few days for, yeah. for that. That's what I was going to say. It sounds like RTD is moving pretty quickly, and um, I assume Elise is probably already thinking of this being an agenda item for our full committee meeting at the early in December. Good. That'd be good to check. All right. If, we, if you could check on that and, and, you know, if it is, then we don't need to redo that here in our committee. We just need to make sure that if there are any questions that come out of that, we can address those. So okay. what we might do is we might say, if it, say, assuming it's going to be in the full committee, then let's, let's listen to that and figure out what additional questions we might have and who might be able to come back and answer those additional questions. You know, so I, you I, put that on the agenda as, as any additional questions for the first meeting after the next main meeting of the uh, full committee. Yes, Lynn? I, I just, um, I don't know that uh, Doug has spoken with the group before and I just wanted to introduce him that uh, Heather McKillop, our CFO is leaving, going to uh, uh, Sonoma, Moran, uh, area um, and Doug I think is uh, is stepping in as an interim to handle the financial 
uh, questions here and, and uh, I think an interim CFO sort of role. Um, so you know who we're talking to. Good, we can even see him. Hi, Doug. <laughs> Thank you so much. It sounds like you have a challenging job. <laughs> hey, Rut. Um, as it relates to the as it relates to this question, is there a context? Is there some concern that RTDA is spending these funds on, you know, vacations in the Bahamas, or uh, you know, they're just basically reimbursing themselves for expenditures? So, yeah, I, I'm just trying to understand why why the focus on this particular issue. I think anytime there's that many millions of dollars that flows in from outside, there's a natural instinct to think, hey, are these guys really spending this money right? And why are they in such financial straits if they had 300 something million dollars that are that's coming in from outside? I think if we, those of us who have looked pretty closely at this have a reasonable degree of comfort that they haven't been going to the Bahamas doing fishing trips or anything like that. So, you know, it, it, but I have to tell you, there's, there are always people out there, uh, especially ones that don't represent people within the region, who may feel like that, that money like this is not necessarily always spent in the most efficient manner possible. So. Okay. Yep. We're getting a little audit kind of thing going here. All right, uh, that's enough on CARES. Uh, this, the review of state audits and other financial related documents. You know, I've looked through the last four years of, of financials and the, you know, the reports that look at the prior year and have those things combined. If there's nothing that I saw in any of that that really popped out to me. I, I could nitpick, but you know, that necessarily may not be enough to satisfy, however, uh, the people who have assigned us this. But all of these are audited. Uh, the, the only thing I'd like a better explanation uh, of, and it's something that always seems to come up in board meetings of, of, uh, of you know, regular, not, you know, not agencies, but businesses that I've been involved in, or, uh, particularly the, the uh, pension funds. And so, uh, Doug, if that's something you might be able to speak to, you know, I've underfunded pensions are rampant in, in the regular uh, for-profit corporate environment. And so I wonder how well-funded our pensions are. Yeah, sure, Rut. Um, so we actually have two pension plans and uh, we also have a defined contribution retirement plan. So for our, our non-represented or salaried employees, we have a pension plan that was closed to new employees on uh, January 1st, 2008. So only employees that were employed by RTD that are non-represented can be in that plan if they were employed prior to January 1st, 2008. So that plan is basically closed. That plan is about 80% funded, so it's in pretty darn good shape. Um, we have not been putting in the full actuarial required contribution. So for instance, in 2021, the actuary said that they recommend we put in 8.6 million. We're only gonna put in 6.1 million just because of our financial constraints. But for all intents and purposes, that is that fund, that pension plan is considered to be um, in pretty good shape at 80% funded. The other plan is where we have issues and that's for our represented employees. So that one is still open. Um, that plan is only uh, 40, about 42% funded right now. Um, we were able, it would, it had been declining. It was back, it was back, I think, uh, 2005, 2008, that time frame when the pl plan was last 100% funded. Um, some benefits were changed where Benefits were increased because times were good at that time. And ever since then, the plan has decreased in its funding status. So it's currently about 42, 45% funded, but it's been in that range for the last two or three years because with the current collective bargaining agreement, 
Um, RTD has been putting in 13% of the employee's wages. The employee puts in 5%, so a total of 18% of wages go towards contributions. Plus, in this current three-year collective bargaining agreement, RTD is putting in an extra $6.2 million. So that's, that amount has been almost enough to meet the required contribution annually to keep that plan from getting, for, from its funding from getting worse. Well, it doesn't sound like it's in great shape either. No, no. And, you know, they we've changed a lot of benefits on that. Um, the trust, the trust has where um, employees that were hired after 2011, they only vest at 1% per year, meaning that they only earn 1% of their um, wages each year towards their retirement. Anybody prior to that earns 2.5%. So I know that's a little bit, bit too much detail, but we've done some things to kind of stop the bleeding on right. that, but um, we're limited from making too many changes and all of it has to be collectively bargained. RTD from a legal standpoint has always maintained that we only have a legal obligation to, to um, contribute to that plan because it's a single employer standalone plan. Our only legal obligation is to put in what we've agreed to in the collective bargaining agreement, but um, we've also gotten legal opinions saying that we have a moral obligation to make sure our employees um, receive their retirement benefits, and, and we've taken that stance all along as well. You know, I think this is this is something that's uh, is significant enough that it would be good to be able to get like a one or two page. Here's where we are in funding our uh, our retirement plans and our pensions. Great, yeah. Is that is that something? I know you're you're pretty busy trying to cover all other stuff, but uh, is that something that within the next couple of months or so you could get for us? Oh yeah, I can get that to you this week. I'll just um, I'll summarize wow. things in summary page. You want to get some time? Give it to somebody that's busy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I I would really appreciate that. We let's put it on the agenda for next meeting to just have a quick look at it and comment. That's that was the only thing I saw. You know, I'm I'm certainly no auditor, but uh, but in look, reading the financial reports, that was the one thing that I had some concerns about. And Red, I'm no auditor either, <laughs> um, but I I wonder if this is more broadly an an area where we would want North Highland to provide some perspective as well. Mm hmm We could. We could. I the, the always the my concern is I want to limit their hours if we're gonna have them do something like this. It's the kind of project that you could spend the whole hundred thousand dollar budget on pretty quickly. And that's not what we want because there's some other things I think we should think about doing that might consume some of that. But Rebecca, do you want to give that some thought and talk about it at the next meeting? What we might have them do? North Something Island? more specific? Mm -hmm, sure. Okay, you have that task. All right. Ron's over there writing it down. <laughs> okay, um, review of the district's short-term and long-term prioritization of resources to maximize the district's limited dollars for the benefit of taxpayers. That's a pretty broad statement. I mean, is there a reason to think that RT is not doing that? I mean, if, if you're cutting, if you're cutting positions and if you're cutting your service area and you're doing all those other things, that they're not being done for fun. They're being done because it's you know trying to work within within uh, the income that RTD has. I don't. I just don't feel a great sensitivity to that question, but I'm sure there are people that want an answer to it. So um, it would be nice if we could put together something on that. You know, a few sentences, but not a. I don't, I don't want to spend an enormous amount of time in it. I don't think there's any uh, any smoke or any fire on that issue. But well, I'm open so. to listening to my fellow committee members on this. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I think 
I think the CARES Act comes comes in on C, um, certainly under short term prioritization of resources. So that'll that'll help us respond to that one. Um, you know, the the longer term, I I think you're right. Our job is to provide a, a second critical eye, and are we? What more can we do to meet that obligation there? Yeah. And Dan, I'm looking to you for uh, input as well, for sure. Yeah, Dan. Well, uh, is there some expectation from either the governor or the legislature or both that we are going to respond to each one of these uh, charges that we've been given here? And you know, I think there is. I, th I think that's part of the reason that they gave them to us. Uh, and some of them are probably just from one or two legislators or something like that, as opposed to a well thought out, you know, here are the here are the most serious issues. I don't think they know enough about RTD to really know what the issues might be. Well, it, it seems like to answer some of these questions or even have an opinion about them, we first have to get the information from RTD or the consultants. Uh, and it might be helpful to go through these and say, RTD, could you get us a report on this issue? For example, number two here. It's talking about recent state audits and other financial related documents, including with respect to staff management, retention and hiring. And those seem like they're a little disconnected to me. But, um, you know, it seems like RTD could tell us, well, what are your planned staffing levels? How many do you have? What is your turnover rate? Those kinds of things. And if we knew which things that they could give us some report on, uh, then we could review that and then we could make some kind we agree with it we don't agree maybe they ought to think about doing xyz or something like that right. if in fact what we're supposed to do is provide a report back to uh, the legislature and the governor and say we reviewed these items this is information provided by rtd this is our take on it and that's a good suggestion kristen i i was just thinking that same thing um dan we kind of skipped over that second phrase in point B as far as staff management retention. That's so such a big issue right now, especially with accessoritis is, is employee retention. And I also, I, I would really like to see what's going on with the staff. Um, I, maybe just to have someone tell me that my feeling that there's a lot of duplicity uh, going on right now, that my feeling, that idea that I have in my head is false. So a reassurance that that's not- A reassurance that that's not happening, because that is what I see uh, from what limited view I have hmm. of the RTD staff. Well, in, in that regard, since we're running out of time, maybe uh, one of the things that uh, we might want to do here is to go through this list and say, here are some things that are suitable for first RTD input and second, uh, potentially review from the consultants. Rebecca, you want to you wanna take that on? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think That's Dan's a, comments were pretty spot on. That's an excellent idea. And okay. I'll just add that I think that uh, you know RTD staff would would welcome that opportunity to to uh, provide some of this information. I'm happy to talk with you more, Rebecca. Okay. Great. If you guys could communicate, I think you know a part of this is that we we just need to uh, basically figure out what it is we 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 may need to spend more time on and may need to get in more deeply. So. Yeah, and, and I would add, you know, with, with that eye of, as was mentioned earlier, trying to find those game changers. Yeah. Uh, that'll really make a difference. I agree. Okay. Uh, and um, Ron, can you put that on the next yes, agenda? I, I will, Rod. And I, I did want to just share with the subcommittee, um, you know, uh, North Highland, we did, we did have them do sort of a, an exit interview with Heather McKillop, if you will, um, kind of to, and they ha they're starting their review of sort of RTD budget and financial information. 
uh, as some of the basic research, and we're planning on having a conversation with them, kind of get, look, they've, they've looked at a number of public agencies, transit agencies. Um, we want some feedback from them based on their initial sort of research, their exit interview with Heather about where they think um, they can efficiently use some of their time to help inform these conversations. So, um, Rebecca, I'll touch base with you. We can we can loop okay. you in and um, maybe bring bring forward a, a, our our initial recommendation on where we want them to start digging. That'd be great. Thanks, Ron. You bet. Yep, and I, I think that some of the stuff that, that we're doing in terms of comps with other agencies maybe may help inform some of that as well. So. We should be further along with that by the next meeting as well. It's going to be a busy agenda on the next meeting. We'll see how it goes. All right. Is there are there any other closing comments from anyone? Do we have anything else on our agenda that we haven't hit? Is that the last? The next meeting is December 2nd, 22, 2020. So by all means, any other member comments before we close? All right, I move that we adjourn. Thanks everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you as well. Have a safe Thanksgiving.